Hi, this is Kashmir Hill. You're listening to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. I'm your host, Carrie Parker. Today we have episode 342 for September 18th, 2023. And we have got an amazing, amazing interview for you today. I am talking with Kashmir Hill, who just wrote a book called Your Face Belongs to Us, which will be released tomorrow. Of course, you can pre-order it now if you'd like. I was lucky I was able to get a copy early, but it is a really amazing read. I was trying to just kind of skim through it before the interview so I could get some notes jotted down before we had a chance to talk, and I kept getting roped in. I mean, I, I wanted to skim through it, and I was just so interested. I kept having to read more and more in sections like, man, I got I got to get through this because the, the interview was coming up. But uh, I cannot wait to go back and actually read it cover to cover at my own pace when I've finally got the time to do so. But Kashmir is just great. She, uh, I've been following her work for many years. When the Clearview AI story broke in the New York Times uh, a few years back, we talked about it here on the show, and it's come up several times since as it's this company has kept making headlines over the years, literally newspaper headlines. And just so many different aspects of this are, are so interesting. So let's get right to it. Let's not waste any more time. And let's talk with Kashmir Hill about facial recognition technology and Clearview AI. Kashmir Hill is a journalist at the New York Times and the author of a book that's just about to drop called Your Face Belongs to Us. She writes about the looming tech dystopia and how we can try to avoid it. Kashmir, I'm truly honored to have you on the show. Thanks for being here. It's great to be here. Uh, before we dive into Clearview AI, uh, just a fascinating topic, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and why you wrote the book? Well, I have been writing about privacy and technology for about a decade, starting with a blog called The Not-So-Private Parts, which was, you know, my my early entree into this. I write about just unexpected ways our data gets used, particularly when it kind of harms us in some way. Yeah, love your articles. And the the one about Clearview, I, I remember just blowing my mind when I when I read the article the first the first time. So we're going to dig into some of that today. And this book, of course, goes into great detail. But I think one of the most fascinating parts to me about the book, and I've only had a chance to skim it, is the the personalities involved and some of the why things happened. It's just just amazing. So Clearview AI didn't start out as a law enforcement tool, just like Facebook. It has a rather interesting origin story. So uh, first of all, just Remind us what the app does, and then tell us about how the app came to be and how it evolved into what we know it is today. So the Clearview AI, uh, the company, scraped billions of photos from social media sites and the public web without people's consent to build a facial recognition app that is incredibly accurate. I have seen it pull up all kinds of photos for me when you do a search now. Uh, the last time I did it with the CEO there were 176 photos. It works even when I kind of cover up my mouth and my nose. It's really remarkable. Sometimes it'll bring up photos of me just in the background of someone else's photo. I remember one where I was walking down the street and I actually didn't recognize my face and I wasn't sure it was me. But then the jacket I was wearing is one that I bought at a vintage store in Tokyo that is very singular. And so I was like, wow, that that's actually me. And yeah, and so as you as you mentioned, when they first started, it wasn't just a superpower. They were building for the police. They were, you know, your typical startup trying to figure out how do we sell this? How do we make money? And originally they thought it would be far more lucrative to sell it to private industry. And so they were, you know, trying to sell it to banks, to corporate real estate for firms, to hotels. And they just kind of happened into finding police as the right customers. And really their earliest beta users were billionaires. Mm -hmm. When they were trying to get money to keep the, the company going, they were going to all these venture capital firms. They went to Peter Thiel, you know, f f one of the most famous venture capitalists out there, was one of the co-founders of PayPal and invested in Facebook, created the company Palantir. And yeah, these billionaires were kind of just using it in their everyday lives, using it at, at 
work conferences so they could remember people's names, showing it off at parties. Um, my favorite anecdote was John Katzmatidis, who has run for mayor in New York unsuccessfully, owns Supermarketeer, a whole bunch of other things. He had the app on his phone and he was out at an Italian restaurant called Cipriani's and his daughter walked in with, you know, a, a unknown man on her arm. And so mm. he had a waiter take a photo of them. And then he ran the guy's face through Clearview AI, found out who he was, and then sent his his daughter a text message about the guy. Wow. Well, and and the the CEO or the founder, uh, Juan Ton Tat, had some sort of weird history with physiognomy, which is a term I had to look up. It was in your book. Explain to us what that is and what his kind of fascination was with that. Yeah. So so the company did not want me to write about them. I just want to make that clear. <laughs> when I was first looking into this company, they really were not interested in talking to a journalist. And uh, they, they had kind of hidden who was involved in the company. There was very little online. They had an address, an office address on their website that turned out not to exist. When I walked to the building, it just wasn't right. there. And Juan Tan Tat, who I eventually discovered was involved in the company, he was actually using a pseudonym on LinkedIn and going by John Good. So uh, I just, and part of the book is about that, like digging in and trying to figure out who the people are behind this. And Part of what I found out about their reticence to be known was partly because they built this radical app that I think they knew was going to be very controversial, yeah. but also because Juan Tante had what one of the investors called a a little gawker history. And mm. that was that – so when he – first came to the United States. He he grew up in Australia and at 19 years old, he flew across the world and moved to Silicon Valley. And, you know, he's one of those people who was developing, you know, little quizzes on Facebook. And then when the iPhone got big, he was building iPhone games. And at one point he tried to make kind of a YouTube clone and in attempting to make it go viral, was essentially collecting people's uh, instant messenger credentials so that he could send messages to all of their friends. And mm. it very quickly went, uh, started spreading very, very, very fast. And people started freaking out because they were sending messages to their friend telling them to check out this site called Video. And he got labeled a hacker who created a phishing scam, who created a worm. Mm. Uh, Gawker wrote, Valley Wag, it was called at the time, Gawker's uh, tech blog said that the police were looking for him. So it wasn't the greatest Google footprint for somebody who's trying to go to investors and, and get money. Or to somebody who's trying to sell, you know, this radical tool to the police. This I thought this was fascinating too. As you were doing this, and you were, and you finally got a hold of the app, and and you had somebody scan it your face, there was oddly no pictures of you, which there should have been plenty, right? If this app was doing its job, there should have been plenty, and yet there were precisely zero. And then at one point, the person you had doing it actually got a call immediately from the company. Talk talk to me about that story. Yeah. So so when I was first investigating Clearview, you know, I tried to go to this office that doesn't exist. I'm calling and emailing and reaching out to people who appear to have ties to the company. You know, I'm I'm finding them through corporate filings, business filings. Uh, saw a couple of investors listed for them, including Peter Thiel. And basically no one would call me back or they would say, I don't know what you're talking about. It was it was I was hitting a lot of dead ends. And so I knew that the company claimed to be selling to police. So I started looking for police officers who had used the app. And I found this detective in Gainesville named Nick Ferrara. He was a financial crimes detective. And he was the first person who would talk to me about Clearview and was so excited to talk about Clearview because he loved the app. And he said it worked like nothing he had used before. You know, police have had access to facial recognition technology for two decades now. But it just didn't work that well. And he said, Clearview is amazing. It works, you know, when somebody's looking away from the camera, they can be wearing glasses, a hat. He said, I had this stack of, you know, financial fraudsters who I'd run through, you know, our state facial recognition system and got nothing. And then once I got Clearview AI, which he got for free because Clearview would give out these free trials to police officers. He said, I started running it through and I just got hit after hit after hit. I'd love to be their spokesperson. 
And I said, well, I'd really, I'd really like to see what this is like. Like, can you, can you show me a search or, or do a search? And uh, he said, yeah, sure. Just send me your photos and I'll do a search of your face and I'll show you what the results are. And so I sent him three photos and then he stopped talking to me and would not respond to my emails or phone calls. I talked to another officer in Texas. The same thing happened. Uh, No, sorry. And I talked to another officer in Texas and he ran my photo and he said, you don't have any results. And we both thought that was strange. He said, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's really weird. You should have results. You know, when I Google your name, you have lots of photos online. He said, you know, maybe their servers are down. Then he stopped talking to me. And then I did this with a third police officer who was was basically helping us with the investigation. He said, yeah, sure, I'll like sign up for the app and I'll tell you what the experience is like. And he ran my photo, got no results. But then he got a phone call a couple of minutes later and it was somebody who said they were from Clearview AI tech support and that he had run this unusual search and did he know Kashmir Hill from the New York Times and they deactivated his account and then he told me what happened and I realized oh my god this company won't talk to me and yet they have they they are tracking who I am talking to by seeing who's uploading my photo and I realized how much power Clearview AI had that they could see who law enforcement was looking for and they could control whether you're findable or not they had basically blocked my face from from having any results and and that it was it was chilling for me on a couple of different levels just to realize that they were monitoring me like that. And it was chilling for the police officer. He said, wow, I wouldn't think that a company would have that kind of access. Like, I'm looking right. for suspects in criminal investigations. I don't think that they should be looking at my searches. And he also started thinking about undercover officers and how difficult a tool like this would would make their lives. Oh, sure. And yeah. So anyways, it was it was it was it was. It was it was really striking for me as an investigative journalist to have that kind of experience with a company. Yeah, yeah, I'll bet. <laughs> All right, so you said they've got billions of photos, which is just mind blowing. And, and they tout this this figure. What, what? Where do they get all these photos? You said they scraped them from public sites, but I, I know from reading about this that a lot of these public sites have terms of service that are that explicitly say you're not allowed to use it for this purpose. So, were they legally collected? Were they challenged in court over this? What's how, how did this? How did they get these photos? So Juan Tantat kind of fondly remembers his first big kill, kind of like a like a hunter of faces. the The first site that that where he got a lot of faces from, he said, was Venmo. And Venmo had this kind of homepage where they would show real transactions that were happening through the app. And so he basically set up a scraper that would just load this page all the time and it could pull down the person's Venmo profile, their picture. And he it was almost like a slot machine where he was just kind of pulling the lever and faces were just spilling out. And, you know, uh, it, it is not hard to find faces on the Internet. Right. And he had this kind of I think in the book, I call them like like the Lost Boys, because he just had this collection of contractors of people they met online. He said sometimes he didn't even know their their names. And he would just say, hey, if you get faces, I'll pay you for them. And so they're just going out and just scraping from all of these different sites. And as you say, there are terms of service that say, hey, you're not supposed to do that. And sometimes sites have some kind of technical measures in place to you know keep somebody from just downloading all this data from them. But you know, this was not enough to stop Clearview. And they collected, the time I first wrote about them, they had collected a billion faces. Their, their, their database now is 30 billion faces strong. And when I wrote about what they were doing, they got cease and desist letters from a number of the companies I mentioned in the story, Facebook, Venmo, LinkedIn. But it hasn't gone farther than that. None of those companies have sued them or tried to force them to delete the information that's been collected from their sites. And it's because it it's it's kind of legally gray whether mm. scraping or is legal or not. Uh, it's kind of, there's kind of complicated um, rulings, but um, ultimately they they've been able to do it, and no one's been able to make them delete it. Wow. Well, you know, 
it's often said that t technology is just a tool and therefore, you know, it could be used for good or evil or good and evil in a lot of cases. I mean, I've said this many times myself, I've said it recently, <laughs> but I mean, there are some technologies that are just more ripe for abuse than others. And, and that abuse could have dire consequences. So many privacy and human rights advocates have actually called for an outright ban on facial recognition technology. What are, what are their primary arguments for just an outright ban? Yeah, I, I think it's complicated because there are ways, there are beneficial uses of facial recognition sure. technology. I mean, a lot of police say there are cases that they wouldn't be able to solve without a technology like this, where all they have to go on is a face. And, you know, it can go awry. There have been people wrongfully arrested just based on a face match. You know, this is not 100 percent no. technology, you know, perfect technology. So there is that caveat. But what privacy activists are worried about is a world in which we have no anonymity, that we are constantly identifiable and just how chilling that would be. I mean, yeah. just think about, you know, your typical protest and, you know, maybe you're maybe you're protesting police brutality and you want to be able to go and be part of that crowd and not necessarily have police able to just know exactly who's there. And, right. you know, this is not this is not just hypothetical or theoretical. This has happened in Russia. Protesters who have been active against the war in Ukraine say that facial recognition technology has been used to identify them, that police come and ticket them, you know, for, for wrongful assembly. Mm. And, and so privacy activists are very worried about that. And they also are troubled by this idea that all of us become part of a a lineup. You know, every time a crime is committed right. and you're searching for this one unknown criminal and it's literally looking through all of our faces. And, and I think that 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 they find that very troubling. Well, and, you know, it's, it's very chilling. I mean, as, as you know, there are reasons why we have T-shirts that say dance like no one's watching or why we sing in the shower and in the car, but not other places. I mean, there are there are things that we're doing that are not illegal that, that, that we just don't want to share with other people, right? I mean, and that is going away. I can understand the concern. But on the flip side, I'm an engineer. And I love technology too. And so I'm, I'm really, really curious. I know you've interviewed these people. And do you feel from talking to them, does Tuntat and his engineers, do they, do they believe, do they truly believe that their tool, the benefits of the tool would greatly outweigh the risks? Do they, do they even acknowledge the risks? They are, as you might expect from people selling the tool, very focused on the benefits and the powers of the technology to create good in the world. And, you know, they do have a compelling argument in terms of law enforcement using this to solve crimes. Like, I don't think there's a lot of people out there who would say that they're, they're against crime solving. I mean, but the thing is that I know, I know from looking into the history of the company that they didn't set out trying to create <laughs> a face recognition tool for law enforcement. They really right. were just trying to figure out how do we how do we create a powerful tool for judging strangers. And even initially, it wasn't just facial recognition technology they were thinking about. They kind of had this belief in the merits of what is commonly called physiognomy, like the science of the face, that the features of the face can reveal kind of who we really are, that right, you right. can tell from someone's face whether they're a criminal or how intelligent they are mm -hmm. or whether they might be a cheater or a drug abuser. And I, I found it pretty shocking to I, – I was able to – read these early emails that the team were ex that the team was exchanging and i was yeah i was shocked I, I mean they kind of wandered into facial recognition being the the best use case and originally they wanted to sell it to everybody and it was just that the police were ended up being the best customer but it was they kind of wandered into that it wasn't necessarily their goal when they first created the app so how do you think the events and you mentioned this in the book, it, the events of 9-11 changed our feelings about privacy invasive technologies like facial recognition. I mean, how has this colored the views of law enforcement and intelligence agencies and even our elected representatives and, you know, maybe their willingness to uh, undermine or trade off privacy in hopes of preventing terrorism or maybe just crime in general? Like, I kind of get this feeling that 
we were kind of caught off guard there. It's a, it was a black eye. And I think we kind of had this feeling of never again, you know? And so, you know, whatever it takes. And I think I personally, I, I mean, privacy advocate, no surprise. Uh, I think we've gone too far, but what, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? How, was nine 11 uh, integral to the, the kind of allowing this sorts of things to thrive? Yeah, what I what I really enjoyed writing this book was going into the history of where did facial recognition technology come from. Yeah, and yeah. its roots were in the 19 the late 1950s and 1960s when Silicon Valley wasn't even called Silicon Valley yet. The CIA was funding uh an engineering team there to try to develop this a a a face recognition man, what did they call it? It was like a man-machine face recognition system. And, you know, from the very early days, the government realized the power of having something like this, the ability to know who people are all of the time. And, you know, it took, uh, there was a lot of decades of research. And one of the first public deployments in the United States was at the Super Bowl at the beginning of 2001 right. in Tampa, Florida. And there was face recognition deployed on the crowd secretly. And they were looking for kind of pickpockets, you know, scalpers, uh, supposedly some known terrorist. And the day after the Super Bowl, the companies involved put out a press release that said, hey, we are scanning the crowd. We kept you safe at the Super Bowl. And people freaked out. It was, you know, a first page story around the country. The Snooper think, Bowl, they called it, right? The New York Daily News called it the Snooper Bowl. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> the ACLU waited in and said, you know, this should not have happened. We should not be subject to this kind of surveillance just because we decided to go to a big game. And one of the vendors at that time told me, Congressmen were saying, you know, we need to stop this. He said, you know, I thought we were going to get put out of business. Like, I thought it was over. And then September 11th happened. And the conversation about facial recognition technology just changed overnight. And all of a sudden, people wanted it deployed. They wanted it in airports. They wanted to have, you know, people who were in lines getting uh, onto planes, making sure they were who they said they were, mm. you know, looking for bad guys. And he just said it was like this wave that we all got caught up on. And even though the technology then was not good, one of the vendors who had deployed it at the Super Bowl told me, you know, they they got a pilot project in South Africa that they had to pull out of because the, the technology didn't work on people with mm. darker skin. They, they started deploying it. They started piloting everywhere. And and so it's it's always been the case that we were worried about this technology, that we thought it overstepped and that it could be very chilling. But people just kept working on it and it just kept getting better and better. This has obviously evolved a lot. When they first started out, they were very secretive. I mean, they were in stealth mode as a startup. There's some of that to this as well. I know that you talk about in the book, uh, some reasons for their being cagey early on. But now it's obviously on the open. They've been reported on. Do we know at this point, are they still claiming that they're only giving access to U.S. law enforcement? For example, I know that they were, I think they were even doing worldwide law enforcement until they got shut down for various reasons. And how transparent is Clearview about this? And how do we know? I know you've done investigative journalism, but are they at this point coming forward about who they're making it somehow public? Well, some things we can see because they're working with the government. So the Department of Homeland Security, for example, has spent about $2 million on Clearview AI. There are many law enforcement agencies around the country that are still using them. And yeah, when they were offering these free trials, they had law enforcement agencies around the world in many different countries uh, basically piloting the app. So yeah, I mean, they're they're still in business. They're still selling. And a number of countries have said that what Clearview did was legal and violates their privacy laws in Canada, Australia, and parts of Europe, mm. and uh, issued huge fines, like 20 million euros in Italy, in Greece, um, uh, <laughs> in France. And Clearview is just not doing business there, not paying the fines. And so it's 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 kind of wild seeing how difficult it is for regulators to wrangle a country like this. Uh, I'm sorry, wrangle a company like this that's operating outside of their borders. 
and do we know these things about the the Department of Homeland, Homeland Security because there are public records of this thing? Have we had to do FOIA requests to get them, or is it really out there for anyone to find? Yeah, I mean that's on. That's uh, um, sorry. There's like um, public budgeting sites, and so yeah, you can just look and see what the contracts are. Sometimes companies do manage to avoid something like this because they'll create a company under a different name, and so you maybe they're not operating in Clearview AI, maybe they're operating as something else, and it has come out in their one of the class action lawsuits against Clearview AI in Illinois. They had kind of a number of different operating names. And so that does seem like something they're aware of that they might want to shield shield some of their operations. But as far as we know, it's only the $2 million with the Department of Homeland Security. They also have um, contract with the FBI. The Air Force gave them basically a research grant to, to look into developing glasses that soldiers could wear so that they could identify people in real time, like as they approach air bases. Well, and I know there's been some really interesting, and this may be part of a PR campaign, but I know that Clearview is offering this to the Ukrainian army, for example, to either identify Russian soldiers that have defected or dead soldiers on the battlefield because they otherwise wouldn't be able to, you know, identify them. Very gruesome, but a kind of a practical use for the tool, unfortunately. Have they been successful in winning over the hearts and minds of politicians, you think, with maneuvers like that? I don't know. It's complicated. I mean, I think that Mm -hmm. police are very much on the side of Clearview AI. They see it as a powerful tool and they want it to be usable. Clearview is certainly having a much harder time with the civil liberties community and privacy advocates. One of their interesting ploys was, I don't know if I would call it interesting ploy. I would say one of their interesting use cases was they had a defense attorney come to them and he was defending uh, somebody who had been in a car accident where the driver was killed. And the police were trying to say that he had been the driver and that the person who was killed had been the passenger and he was responsible for the death. And Hmm. he had been pulled from the car after the accident by a good Samaritan who had then left without giving his name, but he had been recorded on body camera, basically saying, oh, yeah, I pulled Mm -hmm. that guy out of the passenger seat, et cetera. And then he'd left. And so the defense attorney said, I have to find this good Samaritan. He's the only one who can basically prove that my client is innocent. And so Clearview, to give him access to the tool, and he was able to find this guy who then uh, went to the prosecutors and said, yeah, I pulled him out of the passenger seat. He wasn't the driver. And the case was dropped. And Clearview said, well, we're going to start, you know, we're only allowed to give this to, we only want to offer this to government authorities, but public defenders work for the government. So public defenders, you can use our tool. We'll give it to you for cheap. But when I talked to public defenders about that, they said, we are not a fan of this technology. And, you know, even even when it's used this way, we still don't approve of it. And I haven't heard if there's been any public defenders beyond that that first one who's taken Clearview up on the offer. This technology seems, you know, now that it's out there and we know kind of how they did it, it seems like it'd be kind of trivial, maybe not trivial. It it would be possible, certainly, for another company to come along and copy this. Maybe a company that's outside the EU or the the U.S. where the jurisdictions and the laws might be a little different. But also, what's to stop like a nation state from developing a clear view? What's why are there legal reasons why the NSA or the CIA or the FBI couldn't just say, oh, yeah, we could do that. We got a lot of engineers. Why Why don't we just copy this? Yeah, I mean, what what was interesting working on the book is I found that companies like Google and Facebook essentially developed this technology internally. They could put a name to a stranger's face, but they thought that the technology was too dangerous to release. And so they held it back. It really took Clearview to come along and say, we're just going to do it. Uh, you know, they just they just broke through that that barrier. It was not so much a technological breakthrough as an ethical one. And there will certainly be copycats. There already are. There are public face search engines right now that work incredibly well. And yeah, I mean, countries can do this. And they they do have a lot of photos of their citizens because, you know, we get driver's licenses, we get passports, mm-hmm. they have our faces. And so that's why I think it's so important that we have this conversation right now about what we expect as citizens, as a society. And yeah, whether we want to give up on anonymity, do we want to live in a world where you just walk around and, and 
you know, anyone with this technology can know who you are. And it's a question of, do we want the police to have it? Do we want companies to have it? Madison Square Garden, the mm -hmm. the famous venue in New York City that has, you know, concerts, the Knicks, the Rangers, the guy who owns it is a billionaire named James Dolan, kind of famously irascible. And he is not a fan of lawyers who sue, you know, Madison Square Garden and its 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 holdings, its parents, its parent company. And so he decided any buddy who works for a law firm that has sued him is no longer welcome at the <laughs> venue. And so starting at the end of last year, lawyers who were trying to go to, you know, Nick's Games, Mariah Carey concert, would walk through the metal detector, get pulled aside and told, oh, you're not allowed to come in here because your firm has sued Madison Square Garden. You're not welcome until the lawsuit's dropped. And they're like, hey, I'm not involved in that case. They said, we don't care. Get out. Um, wow. And yeah, so do we want companies to have it? And do we want do we want to have it? You know, uh, that's actually kind of something I find particularly worrying, just the idea that if we all started having an app like this on our phone, you know, when you were out at a bar, Somebody could just take a photo of you, mm -hmm. know who you are, figure out you know where you work, even where you live. Maybe you're out at dinner. You're having kind of a hushed, private, intimate conversation, thinking that you are enjoying the kind of anonymity that we all enjoy in in a place like that. And maybe somebody here overhears you, thinks it's pretty interesting, takes your photo, finds out who you are, and all of a sudden they understand the context of what you're saying. It would just completely change how we would move through the world and how we would have to think about protecting our information. Well, and and I've talked about this on the show several times, but used to, in the old days, we used to have CCTVs for security reasons and they'd be on a tape in the back room and they'd get overrun in a week or so. But now all of our cameras are networked. They're hooked up to cloud services that are storing these things indefinitely on centralized servers. Uh, and they can all of a sudden have access to a lot more information and a lot more historical data. The, the scale at which these things can happen is now totally different. And you're like you said, like it, like for another thing as you were talking that I was thinking is why, let's say I'm interested in person X and I want to develop a social graph for person X. So now I trained my facial recognition system to say, not only to follow this guy, I want to know every person this person talks to or interacts with and build that graph out and, and look into those people. It's super, super chilling. I mean, if, if you haven't watched Minority Report, that's the one I always go to. You got to watch the movie Minority Report. Was Radio City Music Hall, was that the same guy? Because wasn't there another lawyer that wasn't allowed to see the Rockettes or something for the same reason? Yeah. So Madison Square Garden, uh, the company that owns it, owns Radio City Music Hall. So uh, there was a Rockettes concert there. And this this mom was taking her daughter and the Girl Scouts troop to see a show. And she worked for one of these law firms and got turned away. Uh, they also own Beacon Theater. They also own a theater in Chicago. But interestingly, they can't they can't do this there. They can't ah. scan the faces of people going into the Chicago theater because Illinois has a law mm -hmm. uh, called the Biometric Information Privacy Act that says you can't use people's face geometry without their consent. And so that is a theme of a book of the book that privacy laws work. And there are certain parts of the world where people have better protection against facial recognition technology than other parts of the world. And so it is not a message of despair in this book. You know, we can decide the world we want and and make choices, pass laws that determine how the technology is used. And so that that's that's something I think is really interesting is that, yeah, it, they can do it in New York. They cannot do it in Illinois. And actually, didn't uh, somebody in Illinois sue F Clearview specifically over that law and win? Yeah. So there's there's lawsuits against Clearview in three states right now and that I know of at this moment. California, which has a a very strong privacy law. Illinois, which has this this biometric information privacy law. And then Vermont, which has a data broker law. And so they are fighting those lawsuits. Um, the ACLU sued them in state court in Illinois. And that, they, that, that suit reached a settlement. And Clearview agreed as part of the settlement not to sell its database of 30 billion photos to private industry, mm. only to police. And they agreed to do that around the country, which was really interesting because it kind of cut off one one avenue uh, of monetization for them. 
we, we're talking about the examples. I want to talk about a couple more that I heard of. Uh, like apparently Taylor Swift has used this technology in some of her concerts to try to find known Swifty stalkers, I guess. Uh, I know casinos are now, there's cameras everywhere in the casinos, but I know they're also using this now to try to find people that are, I don't know, card counters or people in <laughs> persona non grata at, at, at various casinos. Where, where are some other places that we know of today that this is already, that this is already in use? Yeah, I mean, um, we're we're seeing increasing use by businesses to keep out shoplifters. And so they'll basically create a list of kind of known bad actors, you know, whether mm. you've been like from police databases or people that they have seen in that store. People they've seen in the store. Okay. I did this really interesting report with a colleague at the New York Times about a group in the UK in England that was called Face Watch and they were actually creating a shared database of shoplifters among a bunch mm, of stores. Co-op. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, basically like a neighborhood watch. Right. And so that was an interesting model. Uh, but yeah, like you, you know, you might end up on this list or you might you might accidentally get pulled aside because you look like somebody that's on that list. Right. Um, but it is happening. And in New York, I actually went on what I called a a privacy walk because New York has a law that requires businesses that are doing this to give notice. Mm -hmm. And so I basically walked, you know, through the streets of Manhattan looking for these signs. And yeah, so it's, it's, it's out there. And the question is kind of how much more it's going to happen. Well, I, I've heard tell of uh, either gated communities or otherwise kind of planned communities that have like license plate recognition tools. Like they, there's only certain egress and ingress places for the for the neighborhood, and they've got cameras watching all the cars that come and go, so they could you know keep out undesirables, I guess, or report on people that came in. But one of the more other crazy ones I saw recently, somebody had posted this. I think it was on Twitter. It was a it was a camera view of a coffee shop, and so the, looking down from above, you could see uh, you could see the whole coffee shop. You could see the counter and the people behind the counter, and the people in front of the counter and tables. And hovering over every customer's head was a clock of how long they've been sitting there. So they were keeping track of how long customers stay in the store. And then for the baristas on the other side, hovering over each of their heads was how many cups they had served. How many? Oh wow. <laughs> Yeah, it was kind of kind of creepy, though, from the business perspective, I could completely understand how that information would be useful to the owner of the business. It's still super creepy. Yeah, I mean, it's with with these new analytical technologies and the ability to digest video, you know, we really could live in a world where there's just so many more metrics about us and so many more ways to judge us. Yeah, sometimes it feels it feels endless. And I always think about ring cameras in the way that oh, yeah. um, I think it's kind of funny, like Amazon, got a lot of people hooked on prime delivery and getting packages, you know, delivered that day, or within two days, and then bought this camera, this camera company ring so that you could have a camera pointed at that package and know who stole it if they stole it. Right. Um, we're, we're, we're certainly creating a world where there's just a lot more ways to observe us. And I, I, I wonder what the average count is of how many cameras we all pass in a given day. Oh, sure. And right. Yeah. Yeah. Do we know, I'm sure they're touting this, do we know how many cases have been solved as a result of this tool that meant that they have, would not, cold cases, I guess maybe you call it, things they have not been able to solve otherwise that have been solved by this. But I'm also curious, are law enforcement agencies required to let people know that they maybe have been arrested or indicated in a crime due to this particular technology? There might be the defense attorney, for example, might want to know. We do not, I don't know of any kind of public count of how many cases facial recognition technology has been used in. And no, they're not required to disclose when it's used mm. because supposedly facial recognition technology is just a lead. It's not supposed to be probable cause for arrest. They're not mm. supposed to like run someone's photo and, you know, get a match and then get a warrant and go to arrest them. They're supposed to do more evidence gathering that would actually give them probable cause. And so 
they often are not mentioning facial recognition as the stream of evidence that got them there. And we don't we don't know how often it's mentioned and how often it's not. And it's troubling because, you know, we do know of these cases where for whatever reason it's come out that facial recognition technology was used and, you know, it nabbed the wrong person. Mm. And every time one of these cases happens, uh, and there's there's quite a few, there's I tell the the story of Robert uh, Williams in the book, and he got arrested for shoplifting at a Shinola store, supposedly had stolen watches. And they really had no other evidence against him beyond he had, they'd done a facial recognition search, matched to his driver's license photo. Uh, this was not clear view AI. This is a different facial recognition system. Then they showed that his photo to a woman who had reviewed the surveillance tape and said, does this, you know, do you think mm. this is the, they put it in a six pack photo lineup. And she said, yes, yeah, it looks the most like that guy. And then they pulled some pawn shop records on him and he had once sold a watch. He wears Breitlings, which is a very high end watch. Mm. And they thought, oh, this is our guy. They arrest him. They hold him overnight. They charge him. He has to hire a lawyer to fight the charges. And it all just started with that face recognition match. And the only reason he knew is because the police detectives who interviewed him mentioned it. And so that is one of those things when we talk about how we could change the law to have more responsible use. You know, when when a technology like this gets used, I think that the police should be required to include it so that people that people know that's, you know, that's why they've been identified. Because I've done other stories on things like stingrays and other kind of these technologies that are used to implicate people or gather information about people that are kind of shady or maybe not legally justified that they have this thing called parallel construction where where what they do is they that's how they got the information originally but then they construct some other way they could have gotten that information that is usually more acceptable in a court of law they kind of reverse engineer their case so and then they don't have to disclose that that, that they use these other technologies because supposedly they actually did it this other way that's more legally acceptable didn't you just recently write an article of a, a woman who was eight months pregnant who just got busted as well? Yeah, this happened this year. Uh, her name's Portia Woodruff. Like Robert Williams, actually, she lives in Detroit. It's the third case there of a mistaken arrest based on facial recognition technology. The police showed up at her door. She was getting her two older kids ready for school. Mm. She's eight months pregnant, and they they arrest her for carjacking and robbery. Mm. And she is like, what are you talking about? Look at me. I am right. pregnant. I'm not jacking cars. And uh, it turned out the crime had happened, you know, just a few weeks before, and the person had not been pregnant. It was clearly a case of mistaken identity. And yet she was arrested, sat in jail all day, was charged. Uh, They almost put an ankle monitor on her. As soon as they released her, she went straight to the hospital. She was dehydrated. She needed to get two IV bags of fluid and then had to deal with court hearings to get the case dismissed. I mean, it is, it is, it's, it's crazy. And yeah, it's just really that that is kind of what civil liberties advocates focus on is that with a technology like this, you might just get pulled into a criminal investigation just because you look similar to somebody. And there is this uh, phenomenon of confirmation bias that like mm-hmm. once you, you know, once the computer has helped point the finger at you, everything that police gather about you kind of looks like it's it's further evidence. And yeah, so it, it, it's it's definitely a risk with the use of this technology. Well, and I remember I read I read that story about Robert in the book and and the police treated him horribly. And and they're they're kind of telling him, like, look, not my thing. The computer said you did it. So therefore you did it. And that's all I care about. And they treated him horribly <laughs> in front of his kids, in front of his family. And uh, like the other woman, that's just horrible. All right. So we, we, we've danced around this a little bit. Let, let's dig into this. How how good are facial recognition technologies today? And let me just say at the outset, I even if they were perfect, there's a lot of issues with these things. But let's let's talk about how accurate they are. What how do we measure their accuracy? Because I know there actually are technical means by which we rate these systems. And how robust are they in the face of things like, you know, dim lighting or the ca- cameras at a weird angle? Because a lot of security cameras are up, right? They're pointing down at people. COVID masks, right? <laughs> if you're wearing a mask, dark skin tones, we've talked about that. Makeup, facial hair, aging, you know, what, what are some of the, what are some of the ways these things fail and how do we 
do we have any objective means for rating these, these systems? Yeah, so critics of the technology say we do not know how accurate it is uh, mm -hmm. in the real world. You know, like how mm -hmm. well does this work in terms of how police are using it, where they're getting footage from surveillance cameras that's a range of resolution, you know, bad angle, as you're saying, dim lighting. No one's studying that. Uh, no one is collecting all those images, collecting every time the police do a search, seeing whether they get the right person or not. Where we do have tests being run is by the by NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, federal lab in D.C. They've been running these facial recognition vendor tests now for two decades, uh, mm. like going all the way back to 2000, 2001. And they are seeing how accurate it is under kind of test conditions. And they're working with government, government photos. And they have found that it has gotten much better over the years. It's improved mm -hmm. in power and accuracy, thanks in part to more training data, because there's just so mm -hmm. many photos of faces that you can get mm -hmm. from the internet. And that, you know, under good conditions, it, it has incredibly high accuracy rates. But that's in testing as opposed mm -hmm. to the real world. Mm -hmm. And I think what anybody would say is that if you give it a bad photo, you're you're not going to get an accurate result. Um, and so, so yeah, it's just it's 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 definitely gotten more accurate and more powerful. And I would just say anecdotally, in some of the searches I've seen, very incredible. But most of them have been based on a, you know, a, a like a, a smartphone photo, mm -hmm. and that is a, a you know a nice photo with a lot of information and data in it, a high resolution image. Now, has Clearview submitted itself to NIST in particular? And if so, what were the results? So when I first found out about Clearview, they had not submitted their algorithm to NIST for testing. It took them a few years, actually, to do it, which was troubling because there were so many police who were using right. Clearview and they... It had never been tested for accuracy. When they were tested, they were found in that first test to have one of the most accurate algorithms among the American companies. The best algorithm out there at the time was SenseTime, which is a company out of China uh, mm. that has been on the Department of Commerce's banned entities list because their technology has been used for surveilling, you know, Uyghur Muslims in China, which is really mm -hmm. kind of troubling. It's been troubling the way that that group has been treated, you know, detention sure. camps, uh, right. definitely yeah, human yeah. right abuses. But wow, they've got really good, they've got really good <laughs> technology. <laughs> So what kind of things do we know throw it off most of? Because apparently Clark Kent can get by with glasses. And <laughs> so, so I myself don't have access to Clearview AI. The, you know, once the company started talking to me, I've met with Huanton Tap many times. He's run searches on me. You know, I, I, I have been impressed at the photos it's able to draw up for me. A face recognition engine I have had access to is PimEyes. Oh, right. Yeah, I heard about them. Yeah, it's a public face search engine. They charge a subscription. They get access to it. And I did this test with uh, my colleagues at the New York Times who gave me photos of themselves to run through. And it was pretty incredible what it was able to do. One of my colleagues was wearing a COVID mask and still was able to pull up photos mm. of her. Another one had on sunglasses, still pulled up photos of her. One, you know, had scruff and glasses and it pulls up photos of him clean shaven. I mean, computers have definitely, it's interesting because when they first started doing facial recognition, a lot of engineers thought, Computers are never going to be able to do this. It's just too hard. You know, our faces are changing all the time. Uh, we're aging. We're wearing hats. We have glasses. You know, we're smiling. We're frowning. How can they possibly figure out that this is the same person in different photos? But now, you know, the best algorithms can do this better than a human. Hmm. Well, and I, your book talks a little, a little bit about this. In the old days, they would actually do things like the origin of the mugshot and some of the things that we do you know, when we book criminals, they would measure like the distance between their eyes, the distance, the width of their forehead and their you know eyebrows and cheekbones. And I assume that at this point, here's the weird thing. And I know that originally in the in, in the in these tools, they were actually trying to use 
directly use things like that. Like, okay, have the computer figure out the distance between the eyes, have the distance in their nostrils and things like that. And now that we've kind of turned it over to AI, I don't think we really know. I don't think the computers really know what they're doing. And yet they are, they are able to do things like this, some sort of heuristics that build up to look past aging and facial hair and things like that. Is that correct? Yeah, it's interesting talking to scientists. And I talked to a lot of scientists who work on this and they describe neural net technology as this black box, <laughs> right. you know, where you're just giving it a lot of data and it's figuring out how to sort through it. And so we don't always know exactly how it's doing what it's doing. You know, is it which we do know which parts of the face give more information. And it's kind of like a superhero. Uh, you know, <laughs> the the area around your eyes gives a computer a lot of information about about your face. And so yes, yeah, so yeah, so covering your nose and your mouth doesn't necessarily uh, make it impossible to identify you. From a practical standpoint, as we're thinking about these technologies and where they're getting the source of these images and, you know, what we might be able to do to rein in some of this, or at least not feed the beast, uh, you know, short of not posting any pictures of people at all, what, what can we do to protect our faces online? Should we, and should we be more careful of posting pictures that might have faces of other people in the background, whether we know them or not? So I think it's, you know, it's hard to be in the world and not have a photo of your face on yeah, the internet. Today, yeah. But I have noticed, I, I noticed in my parent community, right? Like I have young kids and I think that more and more people are choosing to post photos privately, uh, you know, on a private account, uh, sharing privately mm. via, you know, text, indirect messages, and that there's less of the free for all that there was in the early internet where it was like open a Flickr account, put all your family photos on, send out a link and, you know, then your family could look at it. But so could the rest of the world. At the same time, you have like this influencer culture where there's certain people that are on TikTok <laughs> and it's all about post my kids, you know, get right. the likes. So I think you have these kind of two different ways that it's playing out right now. But yeah, I mean, I think Thinking more, I, I asked this of the law firms, right? The mm. reason why Madison Square Garden was able to ban the lawyers is that it went to the law firm's own websites and got their hmm. pictures from their bios. And so I said, you know, if this becomes widespread, you know, lawyers are not the most beloved of professions. It's right. the, the Shakespeare the Shakespeare quote, what is it? You know, first kill all the lawyers. Um, <laughs> I did ask them if they thought like, do you not, guys not want to put your photos on your websites anymore? Right. Do you not want to make it easy to create a list of your faces? And they, you know, they basically said, yeah, we've thought about that. Wow. So yeah, I think we will... There's only so much you can do to protect your own privacy, but maybe we need to rethink how many photos we put out there of ourselves publicly. At a higher level, I've talked to technologists who are thinking about ways to disguise photos. So they're not mm -hmm. as useful to facial recognition systems. And then at a higher level than that, there's the question about regulation and whether we need more laws like Illinois that say, hey, Companies can't use your face print without your consent. You have to say yes before they can put you into a facial recognition system. Well, and I think another thing I think people need to understand is even if you don't have a social media account, that doesn't mean your faces aren't out there. I'm sure. I think there were even some stories in the book about people who found that they had that you know, I don't have pictures of myself online. I don't, I don't. You know, I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on LinkedIn. I did, so how are they going to find me? Well, someone else took a picture of you, and either a friend of yours posted it and tagged you which the social media companies are dying for you to do because they want to learn about people that are that are even not on on Facebook for example or you're in the background of someone else's photo and and they're even getting to the point with not with just with facial recognition but location recognition where if you're in a a place that's been photographed enough uh, that they could figure out where you are based on the background of the picture there's so there's a lot more implications today with with posting photos and I think I think you're right I think what we need to get used to is not necessarily making them public yeah, one of the incredible stories I heard from a child crime investigator is that he had these photos that uh, Yahoo had found in a user's account that depicted child 
uh, sexual exploitation, and the person responsible had included his own face in the images. And he wound up, it was the first time he ever used Clearview AI. He'd sent out the man's face and said, hey, to this like uh, kind of basically network of other child crime investigators and said, have you ever seen this guy before? And one of them had access to Clearview, ran the guy's photo, and got a hit on Instagram of a bodybuilder posing with another bodybuilder. And they weren't the guy. And so the investigator told the other person, oh, that's not my guy. And she said, no, he's in the background. And so he looked at the photo again. And the guy he was looking for was standing at a counter for like basically a workout, like supplements counter. And so he ended up calling the company and saying, who's this Who's this person working there? And through that, was able to find out who the guy was, arrest him, remove his access to this child that he'd been abusing. And it was because, yeah, he was in the background of someone else's photo. So it was it was a pretty incredible story of investigating and finding someone. Who the the life the life we live in today? So okay, last last question before we go. Uh, the the one who writes about dystopian futures. Where do you think our future is going at this point? With given what you've seen, the reactions to your articles, and I'm sure the reaction uh, that your book's going to have, and maybe, you know maybe taking the temperature of what you're seeing on Capitol Hill and things like that. Where do you think the future lies with respect to facial recognition technology and these sorts of kind of mass surveillance tracking technologies? Are we going to get religion on this? Are we going to finally realize that we need to lock these things down or the, is the temptation just going to be too great to utilize these technologies for anti-crime, anti-terrorism, anti-CCM, that sort of thing? Yeah. I mean, as people often say, past is prologue. And there are many kind of technologies that have gotten away from us, but some haven't. And one of the things that I think about is wiretapping loss. You know, there was this kind of time when uh, the U.S. decided we shouldn't be able to secretly record people. And so they passed wiretapping laws. And the wiretapping laws are the reason why all of these surveillance cameras that are all over the country are recording us our images, but not listening to us. And so, hmm. you know, you can pass laws that give us more privacy in public spaces. And so I, I, I don't think that a kind of world where we're all recognizable all the time is inevitable. I think we can change the path. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful because I, I do think a world like that would be somewhat chilling. So obviously you are doing your part as a journalist. You are letting us know about these things so that we can make an informed decision. As a citizen or as a consumer, what should we do if we want to have a more private future? What are ways that regular everyday people might be able to get involved in this in this fight and push back or register their disdain for this sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, I would encourage people to look up the Biometric Information Privacy Act in Illinois and 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 yeah, just think about what you want here. Like, do we need stronger privacy laws? Is that something you want? You know, talk to your representatives about that if so. And then just, I, I, I'm I, sure you tell your listeners this all the time. Whenever anyone asks me, what can I do to protect my privacy? I, I say, get a password manager. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, just take these basic steps to lock down your yeah. account. And, and, and maybe, you know, What's interesting is one of the things that these companies are selling is privacy protection. Pim Eyes says you should go and search your face so you can know what photos are out there yes. of you. And so that is the flip side of this coin. You could use a facial recognition search to make sure there's no photos out there that you don't want to be out there and maybe try to get them removed. So while it's still legal, maybe you should go use it and find out if there's any images you don't want on the Internet right now. <laughs> All right, Kashmir, thank you so much. That was just an amazing discussion. Thanks for so much for coming on the show. It was great talking with you. Thanks for having me on. I want to thank Kashmir again for coming on the show. Uh, so glad to finally get a chance to talk to her and get to kind of e-meet her. She was she was great. I really hope we can get her back on the show again in the future. I just had such a great time talking with her. Again, this book really is great. I mean, you might think facial recognition technology, ah, it's a boring tech book. It is not at all a boring tech book. It is a story about this 
company, Clearview AI, and how it got started and how she tried to do some investigative journalism to figure out what the heck they were doing. And they were evading her, which we talked about in the interview. And there's plenty of stories about her trying to figure out what, what this company was doing beyond what we talked about, uh, even just at our interview today. And just the investigative part of this, trying to figure out what was going on and what they were up to. It's like a detective novel. And then the personalities involved. I mean, Wonton Tat is just a beguiling figure. I, I'd, I'd love to pick this guy's brain and, and just try to figure out where he's coming from on this stuff. I've seen a lot of quotes from him. I'm not sure if I've seen a live interview with him, but there's a lot of him in the book. There's a lot of, the, talks a lot about the, the financial backers and some of their personalities and where they're coming from. There's a lot of interesting stories about the, where facial recognition technology came from. It actually goes back quite a ways. And then a lot of anecdotes and real world stories about the impacts of facial recognition technology on real people, like some of the ones we talked about today in our interview. If you go to the show notes, there's a lot of links there. Of course, there's a link to the book. There's also a link to one of Kashmir's uh, pages that has a link to several of the articles she's written about facial recognition, though, honestly, I would just recommend reading the book. I do have a link to that video if you're curious about the coffee shop thing that I was talk talking about in the interview. If you want to see the video, it's really kind of, I mean, it's cool from a tech perspective, but very creepy from a privacy perspective. And one of the tools that Kashmir mentioned uh, about trying to make faces unrecognizable, uh, it was called Fox, F-A-W-K-E-S, after Guy Fox. You might know him from the movie V for Vendetta. And hit that in the in the mask that was in the comics and in the movie that's associated with Guy Fox is the one that is now used by the hacker group Anonymous. And you you've seen it around. If as soon as you see it, you'll know it. And I and I've actually played with the Fox masking tool. You you basically give it a, a picture of a face, and you tell it to make this face unrecognizable to face recognition technology, and it alters the image supposedly in a way that throws off facial recognition technology, like maybe it moves the eyes a little further apart or, you know, kind of takes some of the, the parts of the face that facial recognition technology usually hones in on and messes up those dimensions, but supposedly doesn't do it in a way that the human eye will really notice. And I used it and I, you could, you could set the dial to make, you know, for how much you want it to change it. Uh, and except on the lowest level, I definitely noticed changes. I mean, if you turn it up too high, it actually really distorts it. But anyway, if you, I've got a link to that in the show notes if you'd like to check out that tool and play with it too. All right, so that'll do it for this week. Uh, we'll have our new show for you next week as usual. And then I've got some other great interviews in the pipeline. We'll be talking with Nichols about phishing and Andy Yen about threat modeling and Proton and Cory Doctorow about the evolution of modern big tech companies and how they go from being user-centric to being advertiser-centric to being basically self-centered. He wrote a really, basically, I'm, I'm going to be guessing a seminal article on this, and we're going to be digging into his philosophy about how these companies evolve and basically end up screwing all of us. So anyway, there you have it. Thank you for tuning in. Subscribe if you haven't. That way you won't miss any of this great stuff coming down the pipeline. Uh, take care out there, everybody. Stay safe. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge down. Bridge down.